following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Now this school is what's called a Gnostic school. And this word Gnosis is getting a lot of use these days. The original term is of course a Greek word, and the word Gnosis is meant to mean direct knowledge, not merely book knowledge. So when we talk about Gnosis, really we're talking about direct experiential knowledge. This is very different from any kind of knowledge you get in school, or any kind of knowledge that you get from reading a book, or being told something, or hearing something, or believing something or another. This is really fundamental to everything we're going to study in the course, this term Gnosis. Because this teaching, calling itself a Gnostic teaching, really has little relationship with what we think of as Gnosticism, which is the, these days people think of Gnosticism as having some relationship to some old books that were found in the desert in Egypt, and some sects that were operative in the past. Really Gnosis, Gnosticism, is a science of direct experience, direct experiential knowledge. And what that means is that really anyone who is directly experiencing something is experiencing the gnosis of that thing. So a child who's discovering life for the first time is acquiring gnosis because they're acquiring experiential knowing. That's real gnosis. Anything in a book is really just a concept. It's really just some kind of idea. It's really important that this is understood as we begin this course. Because though this course is going to be related to you in terms of concepts, and you're gonna hear it in terms of words. In reality, all the information that's presented in this teaching is based on direct knowledge or experiential knowledge. There's no opinion. When I have an opinion, I'll try to be clear that it's my opinion. And otherwise, I'll try to be sure that you understand that what I'm trying to convey to you is the gnosis that underlies life. The gnosis that has been discovered by all the masters of whatever tradition, whatever lodge, of whatever order, of whatever religion, whatever sect, whatever mystical tradition there is. Really, the underlying gnosis is the same in every school. This particular tradition was founded by a man named Samael Anwior. He was actually from Colombia. He was born with a lot of capacities already. He was born with a lot of awakened consciousness already. By the age of three and four, he already remembered a lot of his past lives. He could leave the body at will. He could meditate very profoundly and was able to comprehend things very, very deeply and understand things about life, about himself, and about religion. Because of his capacity that he developed in previous lives, he was able to contact the internal schools, the schools that exist on the internal planes, which are available to anyone who has enough consciousness to go there and study. And from that, he was able to restore Gnosis. So this teaching that we have been given from him is a direct transmission of the real internal gnosis, or direct knowledge. So you may find in it things that sound like Buddhism, things that sound like Christianity, things that sound like Judaism, or Islam, or Rosicrucianism, or Masonry, alchemy, any of those traditions. Because in fact, behind all of those traditions is really the same knowledge. It doesn't really matter one way or the other if you believe what I just said about Master Samael. It doesn't make that much difference. The important thing is that we try to listen to the teaching that he gave, the teaching that I'm going to try to uh, translate, 
and listen to it without either accepting it or rejecting it. Because really, we need to have what's called a beginner's mind, a mind that's open, a mind that is just receptive, a mind that doesn't necessarily compare or relate things, but receives it more intuitively. I'm suggesting that because, in reality, if we knew the answers already, if we knew the path already, we'd have done it. We'd have already done it. In order for us to learn, we have to, first of all, come to understand and accept that all our old ideas need to fall away. All of our old understandings really need to be cast out, and we need to live in the moment without any preconception, without any sense of, I already know, because that's really a block, and it's a disservice to yourself. So I'm suggesting that you try to maintain this sense of the mind of a child, the mind that sees everything as new, that everything is new and everything is beautiful and everything is fresh and there's no need to relate it to something we read before, something we heard before, something we believe, something we think. This school, from its inception by Master Samael, has been founded on the principle that the school should only be supported by a donation. So there's no charge for the course. There's no fee for anything that we do. There's no fee for classes, for any kind of events, even for retreats. Because of the policy that we have about donations, none of the instructors, none of the students, no one ever receives any money for their work here. And they never have, and they won't ever. So the policy of the school is to maintain the tradition as it's been for thousands of years. This knowledge is free. This knowledge is for humanity. It's for all humanity, because humanity is in bad shape, and we need it. So there should be no restriction. So a student can come here for five years, 10 years, and never pay anything, and that's fine. What that means is that the only reason that any of you are able to come to this class tonight is because some student before you was sitting in your chair and thought what they received was worth something, and then it helped them. And so they gave a donation, and that allowed us to pay the rent. So consider that. If the, if the knowledge and teachings are helpful to you and they mean something to you, the donation box is there. If you can't afford it, it's no problem. You're still welcome to come. Now, as you might know, mysticism or religion is very, 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 very old. And the mystic tradition or the initiatic tradition is very, very, very old. There are a lot of sciences that have been part of humanity for as long as this current humanity can remember or can trace. The two oldest sciences that we know of in this civilization are actually alchemy and astrology. And in fact, these two work closely together. So all the ancient cultures that we know about, the Aztecs, the Egyptians, the Mayans, the Inca, the Chaldeans, all of the ancient cultures had these sciences. They had a lot of technology, they had a lot of science, and they had a lot of deep mystical traditions in each civilization. And in fact, the depth and the strength of each civilization was so great that even now we don't really know how they did a lot of what they did, even now, with this supposed transcendent culture that we have now. We don't know how they built the pyramids. We don't know how they figured out astronomy. We don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we don't know the occult tradition associated with these sciences, because the scientists today ignore that. They ignore the initiatic tradition that held that information, that knowledge. Part of the reason they ignored it is because it was never written down. It was always an oral tradition. It was always an oral transmission. It was always very carefully guarded in every civilization. And so in these civilizations like Egypt and the Aztecs, they had deep, profound knowledge. And they had very sophisticated technologies, both in terms of physical technologies and occult technologies. Occult meaning secret, meaning hidden. This term occult has this sort of negative uh, connotation now, but in reality, it just means esoteric. It just means hidden. And amongst all of that, they called these sciences by different names. But there's this word, arcana, which is similar to the word occult. It's a word that implies something that's secret, something that's hidden, something that's esoteric. It also implies law. So it may mean hidden law, secret law, occult law, but nonetheless, it is a truth. And so within each of these civilizations, within each of these cultures, the sciences were exactly the same. When you examine very deeply say the Mayan tradition and the Aztec tradition, and you compare that with the Egyptian, they're identical. Their systems of numbers, the construction of pyramids, just on a gross level, right? But also in the presence of the most important symbology they had, symbols of serpents, 
fire, the Divine Mother, and a teaching, a kind of knowledge, where a person could become more than a normal person. A person could become, in Egypt they called it, Osirified, kind of like we say Christified. Or in uh, the Aztecs, they would incarnate Quetzalcoatl, who was the Christ of the Aztecs. The Mayans had similar terms. So when you examine the art that's left, some of the writings that are left, you can see this underlying science. Now the teaching or the technology that taught how a person could achieve that was in fact the greatest, most secret knowledge that each civilization possessed. And it was called the Great Arcanum. This was the core, the heart, the most profound secret, the most profound science, the most profound knowledge. And again, this is present in Egypt. It's present in the Jewish tradition. It's present in the Buddhist tradition, in Tibetan Buddhist. It's present in the Aztec tradition. This great arcanum is also in alchemy. And alchemy itself is concerned primarily with the great arcanum. This course is, in fact, about exclusively this great arcanum. This is pretty unusual. This is very different from the way it's been for many thousands of years. Because in the past, in all these other civilizations, this knowledge was always protected. In all the different religions, you always had the exoteric knowledge or the public knowledge, the knowledge of the laborer, of the worker, of the scribe, the knowledge of the common person, the outward form of the religion. You also always had an esoteric circle within the exoteric. And the two would usually use the same symbols and the same mythologies, but the underlying meanings would be very different. So, for example, these days we have modern Christianity, which probably most of us have some familiarity with. And we have a lot of concepts like the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have an understanding of crucifixion. We have maybe a kind of a grasp on the teachings that Jesus gave, the parables, the different teachings, and they seem very moralistic and sort of simple. And it's the same in the Egyptian religion, the Mayan religion, the Aztec religion. Exact same situation. And in this inner circle, there was always something different. Because in the inner circle, there was a priesthood. There was a kind of a lineage of particular individuals who held all the keys to the knowledge. They were the only ones allowed to know what the knowledge was. And even a Brahmin in India, when being raised, would only be exposed to the real core teachings over a period of time after completing tests. Now, this is particularly visible in Egypt, where the, the candidates to enter into the priesthood, to enter into the depth of the real knowledge, were tested very severely. They literally had to pass the different ordeals, the ordeals of the elements, like earth and air and water and fire, physically. So they had to walk through pits of fire. They had to be cast into pits of water and potentially drown in order to prove their strength, their courage, their patience, their tenacity, their willpower. All of these attributes, virtues, that they absolutely had to have in order to be qualified to receive the great arcanum. They had to prove it. But of course, after a time, most of these schools degenerated because of politics, because of different things, in spite of the severity of the tests. Because the thing is, once someone was accepted into the interior of this, they began to discover that it actually had different levels, that even the esoteric had hidden and deeper levels, and that they may start learning some of the arcana, some of the aspects of the teaching. But to receive this, the greatest secret, the greatest power, was another thing. Now, if some initiate, some candidate, happened to be the type of individual who had the strength, who had the courage, who had the patience, and also had the ability to keep their mouth closed, to not speak of what they said they would not speak of, then they might be allowed to know what this great arcana is. And upon doing that, always, this is always, this is for every tradition, this is for all of time until very recently, they took a vow. And that vow was, if they revealed the great arcana, they would be killed, always. This is true in every tradition. So in Egypt, someone who revealed this knowledge to anyone was beheaded. And in the alchemical tradition that we're going to study, they were poisoned, 
shot, hung, beheaded, and otherwise disappeared. This has been the way that mysticism has protected this knowledge for thousands of years. I wish it weren't that way, but you can look at any book about the history of any of these traditions and you'll see. There is obviously a reason for that. If you consider the technology, the knowledge, the power it took to build those civilizations, it's really tremendous. And if you consider that with that, they considered this secret to be the greatest one of all, the most valuable, the most tremendous. That says a lot. Now, as I mentioned, these cultures, these traditions, these civilizations were really just human beings like us. And they had a lot of problems. They had pride. They had greed. They had envy. They had vanity. They had lust. They had hatred. And so they all degenerated, every one of them. Some lasted longer than others. Some strains of the teaching were held intact and maintained and kept pure, but very few. Because like us, most of the people who even got in to that tremendous secret had enough of a problem psychologically that they started making, making mistakes. And so many times they failed. They made mistakes or they went the wrong way. They were deceived, they were tricked, or something happened. And so we hear these stories of these priesthoods who fall into politics, who fall into black magic, who fall into many other evil things. And so we hear of these stories of these civilizations being destroyed, being overrun by their enemies, being destroyed by floods, by fires, by famines, by all kinds of different cataclysms. And there's always one very small group of people who were saved, right? Noah, Moses, different groups. They're always extracted from the civilization before it's destroyed. Really, those stories are about this. They're about degeneration that happens in the core of the society, to the society as a whole. Because you see, this is the trunk of the tree. And if the trunk rots, everything on the tree will rot. If the priesthood of a civilization is evil, is gluttonous, is prideful, is jealous, is identified with money or with sex or with power, they naturally infect their entire culture, the people that rely on them and depend upon them for religion. So the inevitable result is that the entire civilization will collapse. You see this with Moses. He received all of the Egyptian teachings. So he took both traditions and had all the knowledge of both. He was also a great master, very, very accomplished, very, very pure. And if you read in the Bible, you see how the Egyptians were not, that they were degenerated. They were involved with a lot of things that were really, really black. And they confronted him, and he had to leave, and he led out the pure souls. Now that story is really an analogy. It's really about this term, Jehu, which refers to an initiate of the knowledge, not just the Jewish race. It refers to a group of people who are in the inner group. That's an ancient word. He led those people out, and that civilization was blasted, and they left. So he was one of the great masters that had the keys of alchemy. We also have the example of the Master Jesus, who also came at a time when there was great degeneration in the priesthood. So if you read the Christian New Testament, you read about this man, a young man, who was very accomplished and had an all of knowledge. And he began to confront the established priesthood who had the keys. And he began to tell them, you guys are hypocrites. And he said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. It's because they had this that they were not using it. Now, he came to restore the true esoteric knowledge and, in fact, to open the doors to that knowledge to everyone, not simply some particular group, but anyone who wanted to change. That's what he came to do. This is the meaning of the tearing of the veil of the temple because of the end of times approaching. The very first teaching he gave was a teaching of alchemy. If you read in the book of John, he went to a marriage ceremony 
which is symbolic, and he transmuted water into wine. Water and wine are both core symbols in the tradition of alchemy. And this transmutation is what this is. And his teachings are full of the symbols of alchemy. The water, the stone that the builders rejected, the fire, the earth, the wedding garments, the second birth, the second death, the serpent, the tree. These are all alchemical. In fact, the Bible is really the primary book of alchemy. The whole Bible is alchemical. The whole Bible is Kabbalistic, meaning all of the books of the Bible, particularly Genesis and the book of Revelation, rely on all of their meanings. For you to be able to extract the real meanings of the Bible, you must know the Kabbalah, because everything in the Bible is symbolic. There is some literal history, but the real meaning is about alchemy. It's about the Kabbalah. The Bible itself is written by alchemists, by initiates, by these people who were in the inner group, who knew this knowledge. They knew. And so like all the other books of alchemy, like the Zohar, the Talmud, the Emerald Tablet of Hermes Trismegistus, the Atlanta Fugians, all the books of Paracelsus, all the books of Nicholas Flamel, all the books of all the different alchemists who actually knew the knowledge, relied on symbols. And these symbols are consistent upon all these books. So if you read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each of those is related to one of those elements, water, fire, air, and earth. And each one reveals aspects of alchemy. And his disciples, the disciples of Jesus, really taught alchemy. And they taught this previously unavailable knowledge. They taught anyone who wanted it, anyone who showed that they were really penitent and that they really wanted to change and that they really wanted to know what the truth was. And as we know from the story, this infuriated the powers that were in power the traditions that were there, because they refused to see the truth of what he said, because they were identified with pride and with power. And so they killed him. And his disciples were hunted and persecuted and martyred and killed. And so his teaching went underground, and it split in many different ways. Most specifically, it split into a very large development and a very small, practically invisible esoteric group. The larger group was in reality formed by the Roman Empire, who adopted the Christian symbology into their own system in order to maintain control of the empire. And they changed a lot of things. This became the Roman Catholic Church. And the real teaching, the real doctrine, because the people who knew it were being killed, they went underground. And they began a process of making the knowledge very, very difficult to find in order to protect it. Because this humanity was in the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age, the Iron Age. And in every Iron Age, the doors to the secret teachings are always closed because the humanity has become too degenerated and can't be trusted with this. So for many, many hundreds of years, this knowledge was there, but it was very, very hard to find. And it appeared in different forms and in different ways. And the exoteric form of Christianity as we know it was profoundly altered because of politics, because of money, because of power. And so the core knowledge was lost, and the monks and priests didn't understand what the books were saying, and so they altered it so that they would understand it. So in spite of that, in spite of the Inquisition, in spite of all the killings and torture, the esoteric underground tradition continued. And it began to spread and was known by many, many names. Now, the founder of this school wrote a little bit about this. I'm going to read you a little paragraph. He says, This is the religion of wisdom of the ancient sacerdotal colleges, of the gymnosophists, or the solitary gems from Central Asia, of the Iohanes, Samoans, Egyptian ascetics, ancient Pythagoreans, medieval Rosicrucians, Templars, primeval Masons, and other more or less known esoteric brotherhoods whose list would occupy dozens and dozens of pages. This is the secret doctrine of the Knights of the Holy Grail. This is the living stone of Jacob. Now that tradition, at a certain point, began to be known, began to have some rumor spreading about this thing called alchemia. It was rumored to come from the Middle East, from Egypt, maybe, or Persia or Turkey, or maybe further east. No one really knew. 
But what they knew was that it was, had something to do with transmutation, something to do with some kind of transformation. To transmute means to take one thing and to make it something else, which is transformation. And this term alchemia has really been debated for a long time what it actually means. This part, al, of course relates to Allah, which is a name of God in Islam. But in actuality, the name means nothingness, which would be the same thing as the Hebrew ayin. And chem, spelled different ways. Chem is the ancient name of Egypt. It's also a Greek word that means kima, to fuse or cast a metal. So the name could mean the chemistry of God. And these days, what we think of alchemy is that it's a bunch of sort of goofy guys in the medieval ages who thought they could make gold out of lead. And so they used to just get whatever kind of weird substances they could and put it all into a pot and see what would happen. And a lot of them did that. But those are the people who didn't really realize what alchemy was. In reality, alchemy was being practiced many, many centuries before Jesus. And it's still active today, all over the world, both in the exoteric form and the esoteric form. Now, what we think of as alchemy, the exoteric form, primarily flourished in the West, in Europe, from about AD 800 to about the middle 1600s, which is about 800 years, which you keep in mind that our country is barely 200 years old, a little over. 800 years is a long time. And the practitioners of alchemy covered the entire range of society, the people who were interested in knowing what was this strange mystical science. It included emperors and kings, clergymen, monks, smiths, dyers, scribes, everyone, the entire range of society. And there were many, many famous people who profoundly believed that alchemy was real. I'm talking about the exoteric, right? This concept that you could take lead and make gold. People like Thomas Aquinas and Isaac Newton, who are very respected these days, believed this. They believed this was real. Even King Charles II had an alchemical lab in his castle. So this concept was very, very widespread for a very long time. But, of course, being the exoteric form, they didn't have the real knowledge. So they didn't have this, this hidden knowledge. And so this outer form created a lot of problems. And there's story upon story about these people who called themselves alchemists, who in reality were charlatans, conjurers. They were people like this man named Domenico Manuel Cattiano. I mean, he was a peasant, but he passed himself off as a count. And he eventually rose to high office in Germany and Austria and was widely regarded as an accomplished goldsmith and a conjurer. And he claimed that he found a hidden alchemist treasure. And so he began to make these spectacular public demonstrations taking these base elements of lead and turning them into gold. And he was so impressive with this that he was forwarded by the, uh, another neighboring country 60,000 gold coins so he would come there and demonstrate more. Of course, as soon as he got the money, he tried to get away. And he was caught and imprisoned, but he escaped, wound up in Vienna in a royal court doing the same tricks. Then he went to Berlin and he promised the king a large quantity of the Philosopher's Stone within 60 days. So he was given many gifts, put into some lucrative offices. But after 60 days, he hadn't produced anything. So he tried to escape, was caught, escaped again, was caught again. And in 1709, he was dressed in a cloak covered with glittering tinsel and hanged from a gilded gallows. That is a very common story. It's very unfortunate because in reality, he only had the exoteric knowledge. And a person like this obviously wouldn't qualify to gain access to the great arcana. So he ended the way he did. Now, if any of us were really to seriously study esoteric teachings, and alchemy in particular, we'll see that the underlying science and the underlying symbols and the underlying principles really are unalterable, and they remain the same no matter which authors you're reading, as long as they're, they know the real keys. Blavatsky, who founded Theosophy, Rudolf Steiner, who founded the Waldorf schools, Nicholas Flamel, Basil Valentin, Master Moyer, and Max Heindel, Paracelsus, Dion Fortune, Samael and Rior. These writers and mystics that span 3,000 years, and all their teachings are the same. 
and all the science that they teach is the same as the Eleusian, the Aztec, the Mayan, the Chaldean mysteries. And this inner knowledge that they all taught in that esoteric tradition is this, the same thing that Jesus tried to specify, which is to enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. These hidden inner meetings are protected fiercely because they contain tremendous power. And the trans transmission of that knowledge always has required the student to be pious, gentle, and fearing God. Or in other words, the opposite type of person from the person who wants to make gold from lead. These people who were in pursuit of the philosopher's stone, philosophical mercury, really spent entire fortunes to just try to get the single page of a genuine alchemist's logbook or a letter or a document of any kind. They would kill to get the real knowledge because they were so greedy for gold or for power. And so the language in the texts and the documents became very, very deep and very symbolic and very allegorical and would be absolute nonsense to anyone who didn't have the keys. Mercury was known by many names, not just Mercury. It was called the silvery water, the ever-fugitive, the divine water, the masculine feminine, the seed of the dragon, the bile of the dragon, divine dew, Scythian water, sea water, water of the moon, and milk of a black cow. These are all names for one thing. They intentionally made it very confusing. The profane ones, the greedy ones, wanting access, <coughs> may get a hold of a book like this. It would make no sense of it because they would take everything literally, and they would build these devices just the way we interpret the Bible today, the same thing. Or any of the great books, we interpret them literally. The meaning is not there. It isn't literal. One story illustrates this about this man named Bernard of Treviso. He began searching for the truth about alchemy when he was 14. And he was a count, so he had money. He spent his entire fortune and his entire life going from one alchemist to another. He traveled all over the world. When he was 66, after a lifetime, he finally found someone who told him the secret. And though he lived only a few more years, he said that it was worth his whole life and all of his treasure to have finally found it. This is an engraving by a man named Heinrich Kunrat. And this plate, this engraving, shows the alchemical citadel. This is the knowledge inside the center. Here's the world. And you see, most people are just going about their business. They're businessmen. They're doing whatever they do. And they have no interest at all in this. Some want access to the real knowledge. But they don't know which door to take. Because from the outside, it all looks the same. There's 21 doors around the outside. 20 of them are false. 20 of them lead into very complicated theories, into very different movements and sects, into different kinds of concepts and ideologies, all the different things you can possibly imagine. But they're all false paths. They're illustrated here by things like the work with physical mercury, or trying to really make gold from lead. And once someone goes into this door, they can then go into these other rooms, but they can never gain access here as long as they're maintaining these concepts, these beliefs. It's a labyrinth, and they can only be lost in it. The 21st door is the only real door. It's very narrow. It's very difficult to find. In order to enter this door, one has to have certain qualities. There is a warden who guards the way and requires that the person who wants to enter must have faith, must have silence, and must do good works. In short, the person must be pious and gentle and fear in God, as the alchemists say. And this 21st path really refers to the 21st card of the real tarot, which is the card of transformation or transmutation. This card in the past has been confused with the 22nd or the crown of life. But it really is the card of transmutation, and it was changed. The card shows a magician 
with the staff of the patriarchs like the staff of Moses or the staff of Aaron or the staff of the Egyptian pharaohs, which represents the arisen Kundalini. And he holds the Ankh cross, which is the Tao cross. And he's standing on a crocodile that's waiting to devour him. The crocodile is Seth, or Satan, the psychological I, the myself, the ego, the mind, who's always waiting for those who let themselves fall. But the magician courageously holds the Tao cross to defend himself. The Tao cross is a symbol of the great arcana. The magician is covered with a tiger skin. The tiger skin esoterically symbolizes the mystical death of John the Baptist. It also represents the knights of the tiger, similar to the Aztec jaguar knights, who struggled against the ego, and who struggled in revolutionary psychology against themselves, against their own defects. And the number 21 is also known as the fool, which is the one who lets himself fall, the failure, the one who's dangerously close to falling. Now in this, we see our situation, the choice we need to make. And if we find that 21st door, then there's access potentially to the real knowledge. Passing the warden, which passes between two columns, we cross the waters. We pass beneath this tower, which is topped by a symbol, which is the symbol of Venus and Mercury crossed, combined. This is also a symbol of the Great Arcanum. Passing under that, you see the one who's been successful kneeling and praying, praising God. And you see the masters here giving him guidance on the other side. And inside are the seven aspects of the work, the seven stages of the initial stage. Before him is a mountain, and on top of the mountain is a dragon, and the dragon holds the philosopher's stone, which he will only yield to the one who completes the work required of him. Now, there was a very famous man who wrote a pretty famous book about uh, the mystical sciences, and he said, for all alchemists taught what few people suspect, that one cannot succeed in attaining the secret of gold unless one has an upright and honest soul. Alchemy is not a purely physical science. Personal qualities are rigorously exacted by it. And another famous alchemist named Nicholas Valois from the 15th century wrote, the good God granted me this divine secret through my prayers and the good intentions I had of using it well. The science is lost if purity of heart is lost. So as you might guess, there are far more people who want to make gold from lead than there are people who want genuine internal knowledge and people who really want to change and who really want to overcome themselves. Alchemy, just like Tantra, is commonly understood only in terms of desire, only in terms of the mind and unquenchable desire. Because most of us have a mind that consists entirely of desire, whether we see it or not. And we understand things only in terms of our desires, our cravings, and our aversions. This tradition of alchemy has changed. In February of 1962, there was a, an event called a conjunction by the scientists, which throughout the history of all the great civilizations was known as a change of the age, meaning we passed into the age of Aquarius. Aquarius is a very revolutionary sign. And when, in 1962, the age of Aquarius began, humanity entered into a very different situation. With this new influence of the age of Aquarius, there was a huge shift in society. And you can see this easily in our culture. Mass rebellion against the old ways, sexual experimentation, giant social earthquakes, shaking up everything in society, and a very strong spiritual longing began to manifest. These two elements, this rebellion to tradition and the thirst for knowledge, are a direct effect of the influence of Aquarius. Aquarius is the water carrier, the one who brings the water, the one who brings the knowledge. So the arrival of the age of Aquarius is the arrival of the revelation of all the hidden knowledge. So starting in 1962, you began to see a proliferation of new books, new teachers, new teachings in the West. All of these teachers who came from India, from Tibet, from China, from Japan, from all these places. And this revelation was accompanied, of course, by a blizzard of false knowledge. 
what happens when the real knowledge comes, it is surrounded by lies, by wolves in sheepskin, who either unconsciously or purposely try to subvert the good intentions of the ones who want to find the 21st path, and who subvert those intentions in order to feed their own lust, their own pride, their own greed. We see this very easily now. Open up any magazine and see all these classes on, quote, esoteric teachings, where you have to pay $1,000 for a weekend workshop. No master in history ever did that. And now we have all these people doing that. And now we can find these many teachers who supposedly have all this hidden knowledge. But how do we know? How do we know? How do we know what we read, what we hear? How do you even know what I'm telling you has any truth? How do you have any idea? How do you know that this isn't just one of these rooms? How can you find that out? There's only one way. You have to find out by finding your own gnosis inside of yourself. Your own direct experience. Not believing or disbelieving. Knowing because you have seen it in yourself. Knowing because you have your own direct knowledge of it. The Master Samael gave us some clues about this. He says there's really four kinds of knowledge. The first is yadna vidya, which is knowledge that's acquired with certain interior powers, awakened within our own inner nature through certain kinds of rituals. The Kabbalistic mahavidya is the science of the Kabbalah, which can be either angelic or diabolic, depending on the type of person that uses it. And gupta vidya is the science of sound, of mantra, of the verb, on the science of harmony. Now really all of these are the root of all occult or hidden knowledge. And from these three come palmistry, astrology, occult physiology, card reading, any of that kind of stuff. All of that is the kindergarten of esoterism. It's the kindergarten, because none of it has anything to do with working on the ego, with genuine awakening. The real fundamental knowledge is Atma Vidya, which arrives through the consciousness, which is the real wisdom of the being, which is the real wisdom of Atman. Now he says about this, Atma Vidya includes all of these three in the essential aspect and can even use them occasionally, but it only utilizes their synthetic extracts purified of all dross, meaning the real knowledge that we need which comes from our own consciousness, which comes from inside of us, really doesn't rely on these. It can use them in a way, but only in a very pure way. So he says, this golden door of wisdom, Atma Vidya, can transform itself into the wide door and broad path which leads to destruction, the door of magical arts practiced with egotistical ends. We are in the age of Kali Yuga, the Iron Age, the Black Age, and all the students of the religions are predisposed to becoming lost in the black arts. It's astonishing to see the mistaken concept regarding occultism and mysticism and the ease with which they believe they can reach the door and cross the threshold of mystery without great sacrifice. It is impossible to attain Atma Vidya without the three factors for the revolution of the consciousness. Atma Vidya is impossible without first having attained the second birth that Master Jesus taught about. Atma Vidya is impossible without the death of the ego. Atma Vidya is impossible without sacrifice for humanity. It is impossible to reach Atma Vidya without first having known ourselves. These are the three factors required for the revolution of the consciousness, required to awaken. The true and deep knowledge of alchemy is the knowledge that transforms the common human being into a master, into an angel, into a Buddha, and thus gives him access to Atma Vidya. And to achieve this tremendous transformation has zero to do with belief or concept. It is a complete psychological revolution, a revolution of the whole person on every level. It is an exact science, and it is filled with dangers from within and without, and each step holds the potential for falling from the path, so it takes great care and great attention. This path is this one path, the same path 
taught by every master who achieved it. The same path that illuminated all the angels and Buddhas of every tradition, no matter what culture or religion or age they blossomed from. Alchemy, then, is the secret doctrine of the Christ that teaches humanity of every age and every culture how to come to the Father by the single and solitary path through the sun, through the fire, through the water. These three factors are what the Master Jesus talked about when he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross, which is the work of alchemy, and he must follow me, sacrifice for humanity, helping others. Any school, anywhere on this planet who teaches the real path always teaches these three factors. Always. And if one of those is missing, something is missing in the knowledge. Master Samael said, the centers of knowledge are now converted to business places, each with its tyrant that forbids its adepts and students to go in search of knowledge. The prohibitions here, the excommunications and threats there, always leaving things for tomorrow, making a big issue out of the password, the amulet, of the secrets that no other school possesses, etc. We are not looking for flatterers or of masters, nor are we interested in hard-hearted henchmen. We indicate with logical thought and exact concept the path to follow, so that each person arrives at his internal master, he who lives in silence within each of you. We inform you that knowledge belongs to the inner self, and that virtues and gifts are not a matter of false pretense and false humility, but that they are terrible realities that convert us into powerful and gigantic oaks, so that the frailties of the mind, the threats of black magicians, the envy of tyrants, can shatter against our strong hearts. This course is for all the rebels of all schools, for those who do not believe in these supposed masters, for those dissatisfied with all beliefs, for those who still have in them a little manhood and a spark of love. We're not interested in anyone's money, nor are we interested in monthly fees or temples of brick or cement or clay because we are conscious visitors in the cathedral of the soul, and we know that wisdom is of the soul. Flattery tires us. Praises should only belong to our Father who is in secret and watches us minutely. We are not in search of followers. We only want each person to follow himself, his own internal master, his sacred inner self, because he is the only one that can save and glorify us. We do not want more comedies, pretenses, nor false mysticisms and false schools. Now we want living realities. We want to prepare ourselves to see, hear, and touch the reality of those truths. Let us take the sword of our willpower to break the links of the world and to launch ourselves head on to a terrible battle for liberation because we know that salvation is within man. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.